Namaskar. We are delighted to inform Symbiosis Law School Noida in association with Lex Witness, India's first magazine on legal and corporate affairs, TH is the law firm, Sadgamaya, presents knowledge series on law and justice. The knowledge series aims to provide continuing legal education to the members of the bar and to provide an opportunity to the students of the law school to learn from the best and most experienced legal luminaries and have a first-hand experience of interacting with the members of the bar. Today, we have among us one of the luminaries from the field of law, Honorable Mr. Justice S.J. Mukhopadhyay, former judge, Supreme Court of India, and former chairman, National Company Law Appellate Tribunal, who would be addressing us on the topic, important judgments, the parallel court. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Your Lordship. Uh, allow me to introduce your good sir. Mr. Justice Sudanshu Jyoti Mukhopadhyay, born on March 15, 1950, is the son of late Sri Sarjandu Mukherjee, who was a leading practitioner, especially constitutional and in service law in the High Court of Patna. He passed the BSc examination in 1971 from Magad University and obtained his LLB degree in 1979 from the University of Patna. Sir, enrolled as an advocate on May 18, 1979 and practiced at the Patna and Rachi benches of High Court of Patna in constitutional, service, civil and criminal matters. Sir, was designated as senior advocate in February 1993. Sir, was appointed as permanent judge of the High Court of Patna on November 8, 1994. He was transferred on November 15, 2000 as permanent judge of the High Court of Jharkhand on its creation, where he served as the acting chief justice for about a year and three months. On August 31, 2006, Sir was transferred and joined as the first Pune judge in the High Court of Madras, where he also functioned as the acting chief justice for about five months. Thereafter, from December 8, 2009 to September 12, 2011, he was the Chief Justice of the High Court of Gujarat. On September 13, 2011, Sir was elevated to the Supreme Court of India from where he retired on March 14, 2015. On June 1, 2016, Sir joined as the first chairperson of the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. As a judge, Sir has decided several important civil and constitutional cases and to name a few, like the wives of the Bihar Panchayat Raj Act 1993, in which case it was held that the reservation limit of 50% is applicable so far as Article 243D of the Panchayat Raj Act is concerned. As a judge of the Honorable High Court of Patna, sitting in Division Bay, Mr. Sir decided the fodder scam and the bitumen scam cases. He was part of the bench of the Honorable Supreme Court which held Section 377 IPC does not suffer from the vice of unconstitutionality. Mr. Justice S.J. Mukhopadhyay was also part of the bench of the Honorable Supreme Court, which ruled that Section 8, Clause 4 of the Representation of the People Act, which allowed elected representatives three months to appeal their conviction and not to give effects to the conviction by trial court as unconstitutional and further held that any member of parliament or member of the Legislative Assembly or member of a Legislative Council, whoever is convicted of a crime and awarded a minimum of two year imprisonment loses membership of such house with immediate effect. After the retirement from the Supreme Court of India, Sir was appointed as the first chairperson of National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. As it is said that the law is made but I say law is also created, as was famously referred by John Gray, law will remain in mother's womb if not judged by the court. And so is the case with the most acclaimed legislation, the court, insolvency and the bankruptcy court, which just came into existence without any precedence, but it was given that height where people not only appreciate, but have received the benefit and the credit goes to none other than Honorable Mr. Justice S.J. Mukhopadhyay. Thank you very much, sir, for doing the service. Over to you, Mr. Rajkumar. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we are honored and privileged today to witness the webinar on important judgments, the parallel court by Honorable Mr. Justice S.K. S.J. Makupadhyay. Your Lordship, on behalf of the organizers of Knowledge Series on Law and Justice, we welcome you and all the participants to the webinar. And before we begin, I would like to put the housekeeping rules for all the participants. This session will go for an hour and a half and the participants could put their questions in the Q&A box and we, and we would put it to his Lordship while he is addressing the topic. There will be a live Q&A round toward the end of the webinar and the participants will have to press the raise hand icon so that we put them in the queue so that they can put the live questions to his Lordship. We will try to address as many questions as possible. May I request your Lordships to take over, please. Good afternoon to all of you. In fact, IBC, when I'll be speaking of IBC, it starts with one thing that triggering, how to trigger. And later on, when we proceeded, we find out how to save yourself. You know, there are two, two sides. One side wants to trigger the insolvency, corporate insolvency resolution process. And other side wants to save it. And ultimately what was derived that all this cor corporate insolvency resolution process is for resolution and not for liquidation. That is a settled law now that liquidation is not the answer but the resolution. Now the things started changing from time to time. And the explanation of the different provisions of law were explained in different manners. Those sections 7, section 9, or section 10 remain same. But in different cases, it emerged and different definitions were given. For example, the financial creditor, operational creditors, apart from those who are the resolution applicants, etc. For example, financial creditor, apart from the inclusive definition which is given here, it was initially decided in one of the case, uh, I'm forgetting the name, mm -hmm. apart from those who are the resolution applicants, etc. The, the, Mehta and Sons, I am forgetting the name, where it was held that even a person whom by he is also a financial creditor. Later on, on the basis of such judgment, discussions which took place, law was amended, and financial creditors that included, not included, that was there, that was explained that allottees are also the financial editor. Whenever you will be going through a law, the each and every word has a meaning. People cannot say home buyer. The word is allottee. Allottee can be a person who may be allottee of a flat, who may be allottee of a shop, or allottee of a land, piece of land. So the word allotty use is not that generally the lawyer to large home buyer. That language should not be used. See, I am saying that different language which has been used in IBC that should be used whenever the argument should be advanced. Operational creditors became a difficulty when it came to the question that how Government debt can be operational debt, operational creditor. So there are two opinions when we were deciding. We are looking at that time that how to look into it from two different sides. Then we find out actually who are the operational creditors. Merely selling, giving service, that is a law. Or or says the debt due to the central government, state government, etc., under the law. 
Why operational creatures? Because these people, first set of people who are supplying the good or giving services, keep the company as a going concern. As a going concern, for the purpose of going concern, it is the operational creditors, they are required. For example, the raw material, the services of the employees, services from others. But when it becomes operational, it results into profit. The results into profit then becomes, number one, income tax. Number two, sell of the goods, then GST. So then we found actually the government debts are resultant of the operational, whereas goods, services, supply of goods or services are to make it operational. And once it is operational, the benefit goes and that operational benefit is to the person that means the government. Therefore, we held in that case that actually government debt is also operational debt. Recently, I came, it came to my knowledge of one of the high court judgment. They said GST cannot be an operational debt. The high court said that GST is paid by persons, individuals. Therefore, it is not a debt of a corporate debtor, and therefore it cannot be said to be operational debt. But I'm not going on that because the thing may be decided finally by Honorable Supreme Court, which has not yet been decided. Debt of the government is always out of the law. So people will have to keep in mind who are the operational creditors and who are the financial creditor. Next thing is to be seen that how to derive a benefit. It's like a playing a chase. You know, I want the queen of the other. So I'll have to play the chase in a manner and the pawn that I attack the queen of the other side. The other side will try to save it. And there, the changes of the places of the pawns is very necessary. One party may win, the other party may lose. But theory is that chase board or the pawns, that cannot be thrown out. That means corporate should remain. Corporate and pawn like the employees, they must remain. So, when it will be the argument from the side of the lawyers, they will have to develop the argument on the basis of the various judgments which have already been delivered by the Honorable Supreme Court. Start with innovative. Innovative is the excellent judgment where paragraph 27 to 30, I'll be requesting all of you to read it two times, three times, four times paragraph 27 to paragraph 30. It's a unique language used with regard to the financial creditors. What is the financial creditors? The default. Then also a claim barred by limitation. You know, so the language, if you go through it, there you will be getting in one of the paragraph that is paragraph 27 it says definition of debt then a claim the code gets triggered the moment default of rupee 1 lakh or more so default is the basic factor which is to be seen the word default. The, it says that the corporate, corporate data at this stage may come and say there is no debt, no amount payable in fact or in law. 
to know amount is payable in law or in fact these language are very crucial which is the amount not payable in law that is the debt which is barred by limitation not payable in the eye of law it is payable but not payable in the eye of law a person can also show that i have paid it so a debt paid in fact so these are the languages which has been used the words which has been used by long ago supreme court in these paragraph 27 28 29 and 30 i think it should be key of all the lawyers students even those who are the corporate debtor or those who are the resolution applicant resolution professionals should also keep it in mind on which there is no judgment the resolution professional they collate the claim the honorable supreme court has said that you cannot decide what they decide to so liquidate when they collect the claim and decide the claim there is a provision of appeal but there is no provision of appeal against the decision of the resolution professional or the 60 subsection 5 in one sense the honorable supreme court says nclt or nclt cannot decide it but when it can be seen into if it is arbitrary decision if it is a discrimination free one these are the key things which is to be kept in the mind suppose a person he has filed the claim you look into the format the format says that this is the claim but they do not show that when the claim whether the claim is barred by limitation i am telling a new thing in a sense claim is barred by limitation or a default is barred by limitation or the matter at the time of admission which is taken when it is triggered that means the applicant whether the applicant is under section 7 or 9 there the default is barred by limitation apart from that there can be claim which may be barred by limitation now example given my claim is barred by limitation because of the default it's more than 3 years ago but another person triggers i can file a claim before the resolution professional none of the resolution professional decides whether the amount claim that of a financial creditor or operational creditor is barred by limitation or not the form which has been printed by the ibbi also do not have any such ground to show that the amount is barred by limitation or not suppose it um, an amount is barred by limitation which is of 10 years 12 years back no case has been filed can it be allowed by the resolution professional if it cannot be allowed by a court of law the honorable supreme court has quoted starting from innovative and later on that why a claim is barred by limitation they cannot come and claim it but this decision is relating to filing of an application whether that decision will be also applicable in the matter of filing of a claim claim is filed before the resolution professional so far as my knowledge is concerned resolution professional do not decide which claim is barred by limitation so a day will come one will have to challenge that which are the claim filed and collated and how of how many of them are barred by limitation and it may be shown that a financial creditor who has claim for it his claim may be barred by limitation therefore 
his claim should be rejected and he cannot be a member. I am talking of a claim barred by limitation before the resolution provisional, not the NCLT or NCLAT. This is a topic which is to be decided, but law has already been laid down that a claim barred by limitation, he cannot file. If he cannot file a petition, can he file a claim? So this is a new side, I think, lawyer will have to develop those who are the corporate debtor, they should develop that I will have to look into the claim of other. When that claim was due, when that become barred by law, and if it is barred by law, by limitation, can he derive the benefit of section say 18 or something like that? Because before the resolution professional, can he decide that it is barred by law? Another question, he is not a judicial authority. But it is a subject to be decided, which requires a maximum now, because there are various claims which may be genuine are rejected, and various claims which are practically for all purpose obsolete and may be barred by limitation, the resolution professional they pass it. Second thing is to reverse corporate insolvency judgment has been recently delivered by the NCLAT before I demitted the office. That reverse you will be getting in two of the judgment it started with Nabin Reheja, one judgment, two more judgments which have been followed. One judgment is of RWA, some welfare committee, 77 Gurgaon. Another is Rajesh Goel. In these clauses, we have shown that how amendment of subsection 4 of section 30 and the decision of Honorable Supreme Court in a committee of editor of SR still has created a problem. For example, in Pioneer it has been decided that these allottees are financial creditor. Now, allottees who are financial creditor how they can decide the viability or feasibility or commercial wisdom of a plan or the corporate data. Am I clear to you? So there we found that they cannot decide. They don't have knowledge. But Supreme Court, Honorable Supreme Court, starting from uh, uh, this uh, innovative up to the SR still said, no financial creditors, mainly they are the banks, they know. Personal, my, my personal opinion, because I'm no more a chairperson, that is a wrong judgment. Financial creditors, the banks cannot decide the viability or feasibility of a business. They may not in a, be in a position to decide the commercial wisdom is one thing, but it is the operational creditors who can decide who are the operational creditors. Operational creditors are not the persons who sell chai or pakora. Operational creditors are Tata's, Billa's, Ambani's, Adani's or GMR, these are the operational creditors, that means big companies. Corporate data is a big company, but operational creditors are a big companies. They know that how a business can be run. They run the show during the corporate insolvency resolution process, not the bank. Bank can understand only the pocket, whether person is capable to pay back my dues. Bank cannot decide 
that what should be the plan, what should be the business. Now, X is a resolution applicant. The business was of a factory which was manufacturing, you know, plastic, which is of small micron. Now, why he is coming? Because this is a ban on this type of plastic. Why he decides to go for a different line for a different business? Now, in different business, who will be decide that in this particular place, which may be a village area, which may be town area, which may depend in one or other state, which business will be more viable, more feasible? So I think a time has come to decide that how important are the operational creditors for the purpose of deciding the viability and feasibility. Out of the present law, they can derive the benefit because if it is more than 10%, they can remain present. Their presence is non, not only for the purpose of giving a lecture, or for a cup of coffee, they are not called. They are to give their opinion. So operational creditors, their op opinion is required to be taken, according to me, even if by the banks, that whether the business now proposed is viable or feasible. Commercial wisdom is one thing, but viability and feasibility of the corporate data and viability and feasibility of the plan are two different things. Viability and feasibility of a corporate data depends on its type of business. But viability and feasibility of a plan may depend on another type of business. Therefore, these are the things when the lawyers are to develop and law is to be developed. There are other things I was telling you with regard to the flat allotees. Three judgment I have referred. This judgment has been uh, delivered sometime in February and March 2020. The two judgments, you know, we have shown why it should be a resolution. It should be a reverse corporate resolution process. Reverse in a sense, asset of a corporate debtor cannot be given to a third party, neither to the operational creditor, not to the financial creditor. They cannot be claimed the asset. They can claim asset only at the time of liquidation. But look into infrastructure. The financial creditors will be asking for asset. Asset means the infrastructure. The infrastructure is the asset of the corporate data in the infrastructure companies. So where allotees are the financial filter, a different outlook is to be given. In normal course, asset of a corporate data should not be given, cannot be given. But here, asset of the corporate data is to be given to the home, to financial creditor allotees. Now, who are these allotees? All they are, majority of all them are unsecured creditors. Whereas banks are secured creditor. Bank may be secured creditor with regard to the land, but a bank which has given the loan to the allotee, how he can be a secured creditor of the corporate debtor? Because he has given to allotee. And that too, if the allotee has hypothecated or a mortgage, it's a mortgage of a castle in air. Eighth floor has been mortgaged and eighth floor not constructed. So what is this type of security or the asset? So here in a completely different way, financial creditors, they don't have the knowledge of, that means allotees. They are to be given the assets 
whereas in other cases are not to be given. So how the judgment of the Supreme Court and the law are to be explained. Now look into a question, you know, general time is 180 days. 90 days more time is given for the purpose of complaint. 90 days one cannot ask. Normally is 180 days only. In 180 days the resolution when it comes, a resolution applicant is coming who is a third party, not the corporate debtor. Now in the case of this business, if I say keep it as a going concern in the case of infrastructure company. Because now infrastructure is one of the big thing in the market. Infrastructure company, if you keep it as a going concern, who is going to finance? Normally, the financial creditors, they finance. Now, allotees, they are the financial creditors, but they will never finance they said, I paid 70 lakhs of rupees. I'll have to pay another 10 lakhs. I cannot. So none of the financial editors who are the allotees, they will not finance. Now, if one or two bank is there, then they may say, why should I finance? Then how it is to keep as a going concern. Now, keeping it as a going concern means complete the structure, means Allot the flats means sell the plan, flat or the shops. So infrastructure during the period of corporate insolvency resolution process are to be completed and to be sold to keep it as a going concern. So majority of the cases, actually that 180 days or 270 days if it is kept as a going concern, means everything, allotment, sell, registration, everything is to be done during this process. Now how to match the original corporate insolvency resolution process system with the corporate resolution process system of infrastructure. That is the reason in last two or three judgment, we have referred it as a reverse corporate insolvency resolution process. We'll be requesting, please go through his judgment. One I have said with regard to Nabina Reza. The second is RWA Gurgaon Society 77. And third is of Rajesh Guel. Next, NBCCs. Uh, they have also been given non-banking financial NBFTs, non-banking financial companies with regard to some of them also permission has been given. Now, who are the secured debtors? Who are unsecured debtors with regard to these financial companies? How this judgment can match therein where people have finance is there any security in the non-banking financial company? Those who are keeping a deposit there, you know, some goods are deposited or anything is given for the purpose of taking a loan. Now, what will be the relationship? Who will be the financial creditor? Who will be the operational creditor? In regard to the non-banking companies, financial companies. So these are the new sites which are developing and how to match with the judgment already delivered. So you will be finding that when judgment was upheld in a Swiss revenge, that Swiss revenge judgment has changed in a committee of editors of the SR still, where they have given a much more importance to the secured editor. Now secured editor, I had all the time, personally speaking, I never accepted that secured creditor have any right at the stage of resolution. They may have a right at the stage of liquidation. In any case, my personal opinion may be reflected in future if the matter is referred to a larger bench. 
Now Supreme Court decision is bounding, binding on all courts and all citizens. So even if I like or dislike, one thing is to be seen, the secured creditors, their matter, can they claim more than the secured amount? Secured amount is the liquidation amount. Now in SR still is a case of research because you people are from institute. I'll be asking the institute, Symbiosis Law Institute, to make a research on this judgment, one which has been delivered by NCLAT and the judgment which has been de delivered by the Honorable Supreme Court. Why I am saying that you go through and this, there it is round about 14,000 rupees, 14,000 is the secured asset. How 49, 42 crore can go to secured creditor? Am I clear to you? If the secured asset is 14,000 crore, how it will be 42,000 crore will go to the secured creditor? Nobody argued that they can't get, secured creditor can't get more than 14,000 rupees. No discussion, no judgment, nowhere lawyers pointed out that secured asset is less, amount proposed is more. Therefore, more than the secured asset, they can't claim. So first, secured creditor 14,000, keep them. Then a rest 42, whatever the amount 30 or 35 crore or whatever may be, or 28 crore. So this amount, can it be distributed equally to all? That means operational creditors and the rest of the financial creditors who are unsecured financial people. This matter is silent, but this matter one can look into the main one, that how subsection 4 of section 30 can prevail over subsection 2 of section 30. Section 30, subsection 2 is to be complied with. Section 31 says that 30 within bracket 2 must be complied. It does not say 30 within bracket or is to be complied. Distribution is to be complied. Now, if you look into the sub 30, subsection 2, then it says to be that the resolution applicant will have to state how much they are giving to the operational creditor, how much they will be giving to dissenting financial creditor, and the Sex, uh, regu regulation 381A, which is also mandatory, and part of section 32B, he says how much you are giving to the financial creditor and operational creditor and other lenders. Now, if they say 10,000 I'll be giving to the operational creditors and 32,000 I'll be giving to the financial creditor. Can it be changed or tinkered under subsection 4 of section 30 by the committee of creditors? They cannot change it. Section 30, subsection 2, if once complied, cannot be changed by the committee of creditors under section 30 within bracket 4 because 31 says that the NCLT will have to look into that whether it complies with 30 subsection 2. So a time has come for the argument that this committee of creditors cannot change the 30 within bracket 2, which is given by them once it is cleared by the resolution professional, because which is not cleared by the resolution professional will not go. Under subsection 3 of section 30, 
only those who comply with subsection 2 will go to the committee of creditors. If it goes to the committee of creditors, how they can change the distribution? So this is a big question. If they change it, then it will not be in accordance with 30 within bracket 2. So this is another question which requires, I'm talking of the judgments which has been delivered, the judgment which may be delivered in future. Because these are the lines on which lawyers, students should make research for the purpose of this. Third problem which the lawyers are facing, which corporate debtors are facing, once it is approved, plan is approved, even a bogus plan or without following the procedure. Once it is going before NCLAT, some of the committee of creditors judgment came few months prior to my retirement, demitting the office. Now, once it is going before the NCLAT, NCLAT is raising hand. They are saying we are not going to look into the resolution plan because the Honorable Supreme Court has stated it is commercial wisdom of the commercial of the committee of creditors. But my brothers and sister, lawyers, company secretaries, chartered accountants, and student friends, when future you will have to highlight it, you will have to highlight that whether it is violative of any of the provision of 61 within bracket 3. 61 within bracket 3 shows four grounds to challenge the resolution plan. Judges are to be made, I'm talking of NCLAT as on today, they are to be said that we are not challenging commercial wisdom. The latest argument should be of the lawyers, chartered accountant, or a company secretary, or a student, or authorized representative, whoever is arguing before NCLAT, sir, we are not challenging commercial wisdom. Otherwise, the NCLAT, I, am, I find nowadays, merely on the ground that commercial wisdom is there will not interfere. This habit has developed. I'm talking of NCLAT. This habit has developed. They will have to be told that I'm not going on commercial wisdom. I am going on the ground as mentioned in section 61.3. First round is whether it is against any of the provision of the law. So if 30 subsection 4 has changed 30 subsection 2, then one can say it is against the provision of the law. If the resolution professional has given a plan which is not in accordance with the law, so second ground can be taken. So my friends, this is the time when new grounds are to be developed by lawyers, naturally the future lawyer who are the student, by those who are the practicing secretary, and this limitation matter before the resolution professional. These are the new things which have to be seen. So this is the general thing, limitation matter and distribution 31, 61, 3. I have highlighted. Now the questions I will like that if questions are asked from the parties, whoever likes, prepared question or the question abruptly you can ask. Elorship, uh, there is uh, a couple of queries that, that have been raised by the participants. I will raise one of the queries raised by Mr. Avinash Mohapatra. He asked the question, uh, why have we departed from the age-old principle which says that the guarantor and the borrower sail in the same boat, which is the law of subrogation? Your comments, Elorship. Borrower and the guarantor. The old law which you are taking, old law is not applicable in the case of insolvency and bankruptcy court. It's a resolution, please understand. It is not a recovery matter. In a recovery matter, 
there is a jointness. Here you see why it is not recovering. A claimant is not recovering from the corporate data. Am I clear? In recovery proceeding or a suit, the opposite party is corporate data. Recovery is to be made from the corporate data. Here, the, the moment it is triggered, nobody can ask for a single money from the corporate data. Corporate data is not to pay. A, either the promoter will play, pay, who is not the corporate data. Promoter in individual capacity or a resolution applicant will pay who are third party. Promoter and corporate data are not safe. Promoter will have to pay from their own pocket or the resolution applicant, they have to pay. So it is not a recovery proceeding. There is no jointness. Now the moment a resolution made is concluded, then as per Supreme Court decision, the slate is clean. You can't claim anything against the resolution corporate data. Now this corporate data, if you can't claim, the guarantor you can't claim from the guarantor. Once the principal amount or the guaranteed amount is satisfied, in place of 100 rupees, people is satisfied with 50 rupees. He can't go for another 50 rupees for triggering the guarantor or the privilege because there is no jointness. This is the reason old principle is not applicable because corporate data is not supposed to pay. Am I clear to you? Hello. Hello, there's another query. Uh, I will quote uh, it to you. Uh, it says that, uh, for example, a financial creditor whose claim is barred by law files a claim and it is made and it, it's made a member of COC. Isn't it unfair to the corporate debtor and the other creditors? This is initial stage I started with. That the resolution professionals are not doing their job. The main problem with the resolution professionals with high due respect, because I have given a different lecture amongst them. They think I have been appointed by this bank. If I do not support, there will be no second appointment by them. So their personal interest to get more cases, they just ease the palm of the bankers, which I hate. A resolution professional should be like a judge. He cannot take part, either whoever has referred to his name. Therefore, in one of the symposium I said, that it is better that law should be amended, the financial creditor or the resolution, they should not be allowed to refer a name of a resolution professional. It should be IBBI or who should give a list to the court, who should. Because once they know that they are not my appointee, their partiality will not go. This has been reflected in a search scheme. I said 14,000 crore was the resolution. How stale claim? How this is the beginning I started with that they will have to look into and decide that this claim is barred by limitation. Therefore, you are not claiming in the eye of law. Resolution professionals will have to evolve. Resolution professional will have to balance all the creditors. Balance does not mean equal amount, I understand. But balance does not mean that you give zero. Zero is not the answer, even Supreme Court in Swiss Ravens says that both are to be given same treatment. Now, a time has come what is the same treatment with the financial creditor? If financial creditors, dissenting financial creditor, are to be given the minimum of it, secured asset. Operational creditors 
had no such secured column, you know, that was not there. Therefore, I think the time has come for resolution professionals to discard those claims which are barred by limitation. And IBBI must simultaneously, they should modernize and change the form to say whether your claim is barred by limitation. If you want to say limitation under which provision of law, that means section 5, section 18, 14, 22, whatever you want to refer. This should be one of the columns in the application which are being filed. A person do not say that I have lost in a suit. He may have lost in a suit and filing a claim. Corporate data is not present. So nobody is in a position to point out that he has lost the suit. Appeal is pending. And now he is asking for claim. And this is where I am saying, criticizing the Supreme Court judgment that Supreme Court has said, bar is then how subsection 6 of section 60 will be made applicable. Subsection 6 of section 60 says, limitation act will not apply and will apply to the pending cases or after this period can be excluded excluded, you look into subsection 6 of section 60, it talks of limitation. To exclude the period of this corporate insolvency resolution process, that means after that exclusion, you can file a claim. But Supreme Court says, no, 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 even 60 subsection 6, you can't file a claim. So, day has come. Supreme Court, I don't say that is a Supreme Court has failed. We can't say. Lawyers fail you. Lawyers have failed to show, sir, they can't claim more than the, the asset. Sir, this is barred by limitation. And barred by limitation, if looked into by the resolution professional, that can be challenged under 660 subsection 5. This can be looked into only by a court of law that whether it is barred by limitation or not, opinion can be given by the RP, but limitation is barred by law or not, is to be decided finally by the NCLT. Hello. Uh, thank you, Your Lordship. Uh, we have a live question uh, from Mr. Pandey Neeraj Rai. Could you please unmute yourself and ask the question to His Lordship? Yes, am I audible? Yes. yes. Good afternoon, uh, my lord. Good afternoon. Uh, lord, my question has a legal and a factual background, your lordship. You kindly bear with me just when I narrate that. The legal background is section 3 of the Limitation Act, which says that even if the objection of limitation has not been taken, even if limitation has not been taken as a defense, a time bar claim should not be allowed. That is the and, it is the duty of the court. Yes. yes. It is not the duty of the party to point out. Yes. My so that, that, that is with Mr. Pandey Nirajarai. My Lord. Mark one thing section 7 or 9 is a form. Yes. Either form 1 or form 5. So form My has no pleading. <laughs> My oh. Lord has answered half of my query, my Lord. I, I just come to the question. No problem. Uh, my Lord, what happens in a situation? Uh, I'm trying to find out whether this section can be allowed the, in a case which is other way around, where the petitioner or an applicant who is uh, invoking the jurisdiction of the tribunal, adjudicating authority, uh, commits a mistake in the sense that in the notice, which is in a prescribed form, gives a wrong date of date of default, which is now according to the Supreme Court judgment, the date of arising of cause of action and which will be the which will be the date on which limitation will be tested. So if he gives a wrong date of default and correspondingly in the application under section nine, he gives a wrong date of default, which will ultimately guide the tribunal to decide whether the matter is barred by limitation or not. But when the pleadings are exchanged, in that proceeding under section nine, 
in the rejoinder he is able to fill all the facts from which it can be made out by the tribunal whose duty it is to see regardless of the mistake by the parties regardless yes. of the objection by the parties it is yes. his just one minute. so he it is he, the party is able to infuse facts by rejoinder or so by supplementary affidavit etc to show that there is yet another date of default which falls well within limitation what will be the situation can he argue that it is the duty of the court regardless of my mistake to hold that this is a matter within limitation i will be asking you to look into the two provision i always say look into the bear code and the language therein my lord section 7 yes do not say section 7 talks of satisfaction of the court the nclt adjudicating authority Ma when the form is filed this yes. adjudicating authority will go through it and if the yes. adjudicating authority is satisfied Yes, subsection five. But satisfied word is not there in section nine or ten. You all right? Yes. Of the adjudicating authority after going through the form. Yes. Yeah. Because operational creditor when they will be filing, mm -hmm. satisfaction will be only after notice. Because section eight notice is given, yes. so whether that notice was in accordance with the law, yes. then whether it has been filed after ten days, yes. whether he was informed that otherwise I will trigger, yes. whether they have settled in between, yes. so there are various factors to My be taken into consideration. Therefore, yes. the satisfaction will be after filing rejoinder, etc. All right. Here it is the duty of the court to find out after satisfaction means after hearing the parties that right. whether it is barred by limitation or not. Right. Not that answers completely my query. I'm extremely grateful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Milad. Uh, there is another participant, Mr. Abhinash uh, Mahapatra, who would like to ask a live question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Neeraj Kumar. Uh, Your Lordship, uh, this is uh, an opinion coming. Uh, I mean, we wish to have uh, from the judiciary, of course. My Lord is not in that capacity you anymore. You ask from the judicial wisdom, Your Lordship, we wish to know. If you ask for opinion, I say. <laughs> no, no, I have a separate office. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Your Lordship. Uh, but flowing from your lordship, I mean, we have always been guided by your lordship's wisdom. Yeah. We wish to know as to whether or not, in view of the COVID pandemic, should the legislature come up with a notification which dis disentitles the RP from claiming its fee, especially in cases where little work has been done during the lockdown? Because your lordship, it is public money which is at stake and it is being parted with. Uh, your lordship's opinion on that, please. You see, COVID period is a special period in which you know many places may have, there are many exclusions are given. Periods are excluded. Recently, one notification that has been issued by the government with regard to triggering of Section Seven, Nine, Ten, which has been halted for six months. Correct. But keep in mind. That it is only those default after twenty fourth of after March, that's right. Or twenty third March, those default. Any default of the earlier period, there is no bar to file an application under Section Seven or Nine or Ten. If default has taken place prior to the date of lockdown, then it can be filed. Why I am saying because. Many of the lawyers can think that I can't file now. Please file if the default is even a day earlier than the lockdown period. Number one, so you can file it during the COVID period. Second thing is the difficulty is with that during this period, the resolution professional may not be in a position to keep it as a going concern. Now, if it is not in a position to keep it as a going concern, then it is always open for ask for exclusion of time. 
प्लीज माइंड सेक्शन ट्वेल्व विच हेज बीन एमेंडेड बाय मेकिंग इट थ्री थर्टी डेज वन एट्टी डेज एंड नाइंटी डेज आर हियर इट रिमेन्स द सेम थिंग जस्ट सिक्सटी डेज फॉर ट्रिब्यूनल बट देर इज नो प्रोहिबिशन ट्रिब्यूनल कैन नॉट ग्रांट एडिशनल टाइम बट ट्रिब्यूनल कैन एक्सक्लूड द पीरियड so exclusion of period is always permissible which has been held by the appellate tribunal also upheld by the honorable supreme court supreme court has also excluded i think covid period there are many industries which are not in a position to function or rp in a not in a position to make it as a functional i think those are the period that is a good case for asking for exclusion of the period second thing is covid period lawyer should find out the mode the mode how to earn money you know young lawyers may be making here i would have requested you people to attach all the nclat judges including the member technical and uh, yes your lordship that reminds you, quite many things tell them that covid period if a new case is filed give at least one notice if it is a junior so that he can earn the second fee am i clear uh your lordship uh, just another aspect i would like to ask no merit give a notice for second fee for the lawyer <laughs> your lordship sense of humor is as alive as ever uh, your lordship should the resolution professional either suo moto or by way of uh, Uh, a notification should there be something to save public money which uh, which is being parted with especially during that lock lockdown period not unlock period so that uh, you know resolution professionals uh, who haven't done any work at all of course that may be beyond their reasonable control during the covid period but if that pe- if they are not paid for that particular uh, period then a significant amount of public money would be saved would that be a step in the right direction your lordship you know the rpis are not paid who are not paid yes please your lordship uh, if the rpis are not paid my question was if uh, the legislature can come up with a notification which disentitles the rp from you know rp is like a ceo of a company financial creditors are take place and state state in the place of the promoters but That's right. rp is ceo rp is ceo therefore if he is not paid he will leave it and then who will keep it as a going concern or safety of the corporate debtor corporate debtor whole thing may you know it it will fail the promoters will come they may sell anything they may pass everything and issue check they may sell no if they are not paid why do we coming we will have to be there they are to be paid they will have to be paid to keep the company either in a going concern or to keep the company in a safe hand it is only in his hand it is safe otherwise promoters you don't know you know today if he is not there then there is no corporate insolvency resolution process in absence of a resolution professional the process is no more he goes only after the process if you make him and tell him that you go then process is not there process is suspended then what will happen to the employees their salary the raw materials over there the asset of the corporate debtor everything will be missing that's therefore they must be paid uh thank you lordship that uh, i mean i may not completely agree with that i mean uh, just my personal opinion but thank you for the insight and another, just... another thing i am saying that their payment is to be made by the resolution applicant third party will not come the resolution applicant will pay their amount as resolution cost fee and other cost is the cirp cost 
which is the plan first you will have to say that i am agreed to pay the total cost so they will be finally paid by the resolution applicant successful resolution applicant or the promoter whoever take it back right your lordship uh, and may i just take this opportunity to convey my uh, deepest gratitude uh, to your lordship and may i also say a hi to my professor yeah. professor ravandle who saw me as a teenager some 17 years ago hello sir and thank you moderators you have been very kind thank you mr avinash thank you uh, your lordship for answering the query we have mr alok kumar uh, who has the next query uh, sir could you please unmute and ask the question to his lordship yes uh, good afternoon lordship it's a pleasure seeing you after a long time um i am alok kumar from txs the law firm i have a legal question or a confusion which has been going on my mind regarding the dr vishnu agrawal's judgment where it was stated that once uh, a claim has been filed for a particular debt uh, the same cannot be filed against a corporate guarantor for the same uh, debt now if we analyze and agree with that judgment of dr vishnu agarwal i was wondering what, uh, what was what is the significance of the amendment in section 60 sub clause 2 which was brought in on 6th of uh, uh, june 2018 which says that if a crp process is pending against a corporate debtor then any application against a corporate guarantor or personal guarantor etc shall be filed before the same company law tribunal now if i cannot file a a, a claim against a corporate debtor then why should i file even an application i am i am giving you a question asking a question for the purpose of answer yes sir or should If I ask a claim from the principal borrower, please do not. If it fails to pay, then I can claim from the guarantor. Please. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So there are two chicken before you. One is fatty one. One is without any fat. You know. So to whom you will trigger first? Then Obviously, the deep pocket. Joint there is. Once you trigger, you say that this is my claim. You don't divide the claim. You ask for full claim. So the amount claim from one, same amount cannot be claimed from the other. You know this is what has been said. I think in paragraph thirty-one or thirty-two there, for same amount you cannot trigger. but if the amount is different suppose two a person has given two guarantee one is 100 crore another is another 100 crore and principal borrower has taken you know 100 crore and he has given double guarantee or something he was asked to give this much of guarantee Now hundred crore, I claim there. Just if there is a two guarantee for which I have not claimed there, if it is arising out of the same, then it can be claimed. Am I clear? Suppose yes, guarantor has given something more, not the same amount. It should not be same amount, which is the claim amount. what we have said you cannot ask for claim of the same amount from the other corporate debtor i because i settle my claim with one for 100 rupees i settle for 70 rupees i am satisfied because it is not a recovery proceeding i am satisfied third party is giving me as per supreme court judgment in swiss ribbon followed by committee of creditors slate is clean the moment slate is clean there is no guarantor where is the guarantor the amount which was to be given that amount has been taken where is the question of guarantee guarantee is for taking money money i satisfy 100 rupees i take 70 100 rupees i write off no there is no question of guarantee guarantee is also written off simultaneously 
guarantee goes along with the principal amount. It can't be separate. So once principal amount or guaranteed amount I settle, the other one stands settled automatically. That's what I'm saying because as uh, most of the bankers who I'm speaking, though they say that uh, yes, it, uh, they have accepted the hard fact that it's not a recovery proceeding, and they also say that well, IBC was brought in to bring in the uh, discipline in the banking sector and 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 help the banking sector. Uh, what they realize is that if you see your lordship, whether it's Bush and Steel or most of the uh, top ten, the corporate guarantor or the personal guarantor have got away with. And those guarantees have become redundant, yes. despite having so much of haircuts. And that is what the bankers are now thinking, that uh, they're having a second thought that let's not go for IBC, let's go to DRT. You, you know, they can't go. They can't go because there is, if the main amount has been settled, there is no guarantee in their law. One Supreme Court says that it has become playing slate. Supreme Court judgment, is binding on the DRT also. No, no, I'm saying rather initiating section 7, rather file under RDDBI Act. I'm telling you the story, actual story. Please, Lord. IBA, Indian Bankers Association, 7th July was the judgment of the NCLT and SR still. Right. Indian Bankers Association immediately moved in the ministry. And overnight, the subsection 4 was changed because of them. <laughs> Without understanding that subsection 2 was to be changed. <laughs> Not the distribution is in subsection 2. Operation cater and this. They right. got the subsection 4 changed. And so far, my knowledge is concerned from the horse's mouth. The person who was there, he made the changes on their basis without consulting even a single lawyer. Matter was pending before the Honorable Supreme Court. And they said, sir, I had no other because the pressure was such that overnight I had to correct it. So if the lawyers do not, so I was happy the day Honorable Supreme Court says that financial creditors, they are barred by limitation from 11, they said barred by limitation. I said it is a tick for tax. They practically killed the operational creditor in SR Steel and in the education, VA education and the uh -huh. other limitation. Now, financial creditors, they have been killed. Default is of 2011, 12, 13, who can't file. You know, <laughs> so it for that, and therefore I said, you know, law will take another 10 years to settle. I'm telling you still my personal opinion. Bankers do not know business. They do not understand what is the business. Bankers understand the paying capacity. Business is understood by the businessman, industrialist, who are the operational creditors. They will have to include the operational creditors for the purpose of opinion at least, that whether plan is good or bad. And young lawyers, I'm telling you that time has come to show light to the Honorable Supreme Court to say that this judgment requires a reconsideration. Otherwise, subsection 66 of section 60 has been given a go by. If you look into subsection 6 of section 60, it has been given a because suit can be filed. A person can file a claim that I am not asking for claim, my suit is pending, I will get it decided therein. He can say, I am not asking for claim. Honorable Supreme Court says, all right, if you are not filed, then that also goes. But section 60, subsection 6 says it will only, during the residue, uh, section 14, it will remain stayed. What will happen after section 14? So there are these things which have not been discussed because Judgment of Committee of Creditors is based on amended subsection 4. Is not based on section 30 within bracket 2, nor based on 60 within bracket 2, within bracket 3, or within bracket 6. Because there, 
guarantor, the personal guarantor could have been filed and they could have been tacked together as per 16. But the judgment, if you look into the committee of creditors, that is binding. They'll kill you say that these are the matter for reconsideration, including the financial creditors, allottees. I'm giving you amendment. You were talking of amendment. Amendment says if 50% of the allottees they vote, it will amount to 100%. Is it not there? Now, if 50% of the allottees give vote, it amounts to 100%. Now, I'm giving a case where 80% are allottee and 20% is the bankers. 100% is 20 plus 80. Now, if 40 gives, will it be 100%? Then it will be 80%, their 100%. Then bankers will have no say. And these people who do not know banking, being a financial creditor, can they decide? So there are, that is the reason the I said, look into the reverse corporate insolvency resolution process system. There I have said, you can't give the asset there, here you will have to give the asset. You can't give to the unsecured creditor first, here unsecured creditor is to be given. Secured creditor bank will not take flats. Can you give the flats to secured creditor banker that you take flat as per six subsection four? They will say, no, 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 no. I don't want that. Unsecured creditor, the allotees, they will get it. So there is, these are the conflicting. This is the reason in the judgment it has been written that after SR skill judgment, Somehow that, that mad man was there at that time as a chairperson. So that author said, after subsection 30, four, subsection 4 of section 30 is amended by parliament and SR scale judgment committee of cater, it has created a problem for NCLAT. This is the language. So that somebody should go and show that this has created a problem for NCLAT. And then I have given that why everything is reverse. If you say secured creditor, bank will not ask for the flats. You can't maximize the money of the corporate data. Suppose Larson and Tugro is the corporate data. Noida is the township. A township is, there is a default. Will the Kerala will be also attacked? Whether the other place, Bombay will be also attacked if it's by uh, Larson Tigro. So Larson Tigro, asset is not to be uh, maximized. What will be the maximize of the asset? Of that particular project. That particular project asset of the corporate data, not the corporate data. Maximization of asset of corporate data, here will be in infrastructure company, maximum of asset of corporate data, that infrastructure. And that infrastructure, it cannot be divided under subscription for because it will go to the unsecured creditor, that is the allottees, first and secured creditor latter. So how to mismatch? So that two, those two judgment has been given by this madman for the purpose of bringing it to the notice of the Supreme Court sometime that how problem you have created. Now you sort out the problem. Mihir, can I have one quick question, if you don't mind? Please. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I was talk, I was just trying to raise a question about a, a secure financial creditor who has a equitable mortgage. Now, in Hargun Bhai, I think the Supreme Court has uh, held that since Section Seven is just merely an application, still three year only three year limitation will apply and not. Uh, for EMG, which is 12 years. Do you agree with that? I have never agreed, personally speaking, because if you look into two things I'll be telling, but still, as Supreme Court judgment is a judgment binding on all tribunal, I have made it harmonious in one of the judgment passed in March. I'm telling you limitation matter. Limitation are of two types. 
One is limitation of default. Another is limitation of claim. These are two types of different. One is if limitation matter in the claim is the first division, part one and part two. Application is in part in the second division and third division of the limitation act. Article 137, when they talk of, it talks of that the right accrues under the law. The right to file section seven accrued under the law only after 1st of December 2016. And Supreme Court says, no, 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 your default is of 2011. Therefore, right accrued there. Where is the question of right accrued there? Right accrued not for the purpose of section 7. There was no section 7 at that time. But in any case, that question does not arise because three years have passed since 2016. December, three year has crossed. Now forget those judgments. So now the default will be within three years. After 1st December 2016 and 30th November 2019, three years, therefore you can't rely on the earlier default. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alok Kumar. Thank you, your Lordship, for answering the query. Uh, our next uh, participant, Mr. Purvish Malkan, will ask the query. Mr. Milkan, please. Yes, my lords. Uh, my lords, uh, it's really great to see my lords after a long time as healthy as my lords were in the while they were chairing the Supreme Court. I, I have um, reduced my tummy. I'm sorry, my lords. I have reduced my tummy. Oh, is it? But that's not visible here, my lords. Nah, neither it was visible in the Supreme Court dais. <laughs> uh, my lords, my query, there are two queries, my lords. Uh, uh, first is Malad says said that uh, payment to the resolution professionals to be made and uh, my query is that in a given case where IRP has been appointed and thereafter after a period of about one and a half year that order of appointment of IRP has been caused by Supreme Court uh, after getting uh, appeal being passed through NCLAT and then Supreme Court ultimately quashes the order of appointment order of appointment of IR, uh, IRP then in the interregnum IRP has incurred certain expenses what would be the fate of that expenses and who shall be responsible for that payment so that's one Malaj. the appointment is you know he must have been removed by Supreme Court please find out whether Supreme Court removed him or appointment is quashed the order has been caused, fellas. The order of the NCLT appointing IRP, that order is caused. That order is caused. So any action taken by him will be in accordance with the law. You will be getting judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court de facto and de jure. A district judge, his appointment was caused. That was set aside. Appointment is illegal. The question arose. Whether the judgment are also wrong. The Honorable Supreme Court said no. Appointment is wrong, but judgments are right. Because he gave the judgment as a district judge. Same principle. Action taken are right. The appointment may be wrong, which has been subsequently quashed. So he will be entitled. Lord, sir. Lord, sir, thank you very much for simplifying the issue as, as ever my Lord does. That's, um, we are so inspired by my Lord's journey from as a medical representative to the judge of Supreme Court and now the retired judge. I'm saying. Lordship. I'm, and, as, and we are very much inspired by that, my Lord. Well, it's only one query on personal I can ask if, if, if everyone permits. Because I have just forgot that at strict that you have said when you retire, when, when you are in your, in your uh, uh, speech that you rendered on the date of your retirement in the Supreme Court, you said about one asterisk wherein you said that uh, there is an asterisk where you can have uh, dinner. You can accept the dinner of some senior who has, uh, who has invited you. And when your wife asked that you, you usually do not go, but then you replied with an asterisk. What was that asterisk? I just forgot of my mind. Sir. I said that the day I was appointed as a judge, I was handed over with a menu. Yes. <laughs> that menu was DBC. Dal, Bhat and Chokha. I'm from Bihar. So this is the only thing a judge can eat with a food note for non-vegetarian dishes 
you can attend the party of the lawyers. <laughs> right, sir. Thank you very much. The salary was 8,000 rupees. So, D, B, C, Da, Bath, and Chokha. From your money, for non veg, you attend the lawyers' party. They will give you this delicious dishes, non veg dishes. And this is what I said. Very well. Right, the right, 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 right. of my retirement, it's all those bogus speech was there because I was very happy that I was leaving Supreme Court. All right, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Malkan. Thank you, Your Lordship. We have Mr. Pandey Neeraj Rai for a follow-up question. Sir, could you ask your query? Yes, thank you. It's not a follow-up question. In fact, it's an independent question. <laughs> My Lord, uh, uh, suppose after this IBC has come in 2016, in 2017, somebody has a cause of action. Uh, he has a claim which is being denied by the other side. And uh, he decides to go for arbitration. In 2017, January, the arbitration commences. In go it goes on for, say, uh, up to 2020, February. In this process, three years, one month have passed. After three years and one month, he gets an award. Uh, no challenge is preferred under Section 34. No question of Section 37 challenge. And therefore, the award becomes final and binding. It is to be enforced or one can also go for a proceeding under IBC under Section 9. In this situation, when he seeks to go for IBC, he reads Jignesh Shah, which is founded upon B BK Educational Trust. So that says that in the process, if you have lost three years, you cannot invoke IBC because the date of default was actually three more than three years old. And during the pendency of arbitration, he could not have invoked because then he'll be faced with the riders under section 8 and section 9. So how do we reconcile these two? You'll be getting last, you know, full win judgment, three, five judges judgment or the five members judgment of 12th yes. of March 2020. You will be all going right. through this all. I'm telling you one thing very frankly. Yes. Sir. Which forum will they will go is for the party to decide. Yes. Now the moment the default was there, Yes. It was in 2017, December. Yes. What is operational creditor, I hope? Yes. If he is operational creditor, he could have given a notice without going for arbitration yes. and have moved an application under Section 9. Yes. yes. So he chose to go for arbitration. Right. Instead of this Section 9. Yes. So once you have got the award in your favor, yes, award has reached a finality. Yes. The decree. Yes. Now, when the decree, there will be a default. Can there be a default of a decree? Now, if a decreeal amount is not being paid, that question now assumes no. Please uh, understand the question. Where is the default of a decree takes place? No, I uh, I am concentrating yeah. on the default of the main claim, which now takes shape of which is which uh, ad admissibility of which is now evidenced by this decree. Default of the main claim has, you know, resulted in a decree. So that's a piece of evidence to show that actually there was a default of the main. Claim. No, that shows only the amount decided in your favor. Now default will have to be if you count the default, then. In that case, it is barred by limitation. If you count after the decree, there is no default in a decree because if they're executable, maybe 12 years. So you have chosen, you decide to go through a different path. Now you can't turn back to a different path. Those who go for suit, they should not come here. Those who go for arbitration, they should not come here. This is a case where third party satisfied decree is against the corporate data, you get it executed. No, but then my lord, the question arises out of the fact that there are judgments which say that after the arbitration award is delivered and it has not been challenged, then the finality is reached and then one can go for IBC. Yes. I, Only the coincidence is that three years have passed on. Mr. Because Mr. Of, Mr. 
I have asked you to read paragraph 27, 28, 29, and 30. Okay. 7 and 9 says, default, if the default takes place, not a decree has been given. Yes, yes. Default is the debt to be taken into consideration for the purpose of counting. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. yes. So default has taken 17. So, so meaning thereby, my lord, that uh, one can go post arbitration for IBC only if the arbitration is as short as lesser than three years. Naturally. If it is lesser, <laughs> that only shows that the claim is supported by a degree, but default yes. must be within three years. Yes, 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 yes. No, you have all the more a reason, all the more a reason, my lord, that why arbitration should proceeding should uh, finish off very soon. You know, a suit takes place, an arbitration takes place. Only if there is a default. My, yes, certainly. That that is all, my lord. I'm I'm extremely grateful, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful to Ravandale sir for uh, I being, think, uh, playing the pivotal role in this knowledge dissemination, and the two two I junior am. friends of mine. <laughs> Many of you being hungry because of all which I said that idiotic <laughs> talk I give. Me Not sat with the hunger of knowledge, my, <laughs> which is being. <laughs> Taken care of by my lord. Thank, thank, thank you, you sir, for the kind words. Uh, thank you, Lordship. The next query is from Mr. Bhushan uh, Chuk. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the query to his Lordship? Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, actually, my query is uh, um, uh, what is the rationale for not treating financial creditor equally? Why should a financial creditor be discriminated just because he has dissented? Why throttle his commercial judgment or wisdom? You see, law has been laid down. The law has been amended and it has been said that he should be paid minimum the, of the secured amount. You know, if he has dissented, what is the law says? Now amended law? Is the book in front of you? I'm just giving you the law now about this decree. Yeah. The question was about you said what was the yes, question? Sir. Pardon, sir. What was the question? That financial creditor? Sir, question was ki, why a financial why a financial creditor? Hmm. Hello. Yes. Sir, uh, my question was uh, why should a financial creditor be discriminated just because he has dissented? You see. He has not been discriminated. He is entitled for, if you look into the 30, you know, if you look, into, there are two types of judgment you will be getting. Look into amended 32B. Now, 32B says minimum, minimum. 32B says provides for the payment of debt of operational creditors. Then the amount has given provide the you know to be provide the payment of the debts of operation creditor in such a manner as may be specified by the board shall not be less than so and so. Then it says about the resolution the about the dissenting creditors, he should not be provided less than. So yes, not that cannot be given the same amount. He is okay. the same treatment. Minimum amount will be that should be paid to him if somebody descends. But it will all depend. In one of the case, a person was a secured editor who was 98% asset was secured to him. 98% asset was secured to him. And rest of the secured creditors were only 2% asset. So, whatever the plan comes, he used to defer. Because if he defers, he will getting minimum is the 98% of the secured asset. Okay. So, the judgment of the NCLT says, the interpretation is that you should be given the minimum. You okay. can't descend for the purpose of maximum. Okay. So if you descend for the purpose of maximum, yes. then you are not a dissenting creditor 
on the basis of viability, feasibility, and other wisdom. So okay. viability, feasibility, and commercial wisdom, there can be a disagreement. Okay. If the disagreement is beneficial to me, yeah. I'll go for this agreement. Yeah. If it's not beneficial to me, then yeah. I'll be going for it. You know, a person, committee of cater, his eyes is open. He knows everybody that how much he is going to get. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Raj, can I ask a question, please? Yes, Nidhar, please ask the question to His Lordship. Uh, good afternoon, sir. It's a matter of great privilege and uh, honor to have you uh, address on such a uh, vital subject. Sir, my name is Nirak Patak. I practice before the Gujarat High Court, and we had had the uh, proud privilege of your Lordship's presence as the chief from where my lords uh, uh, got elevated before the Honorable Supreme Court. My lords, uh, thank you for the enlightening thoughts and views of my lords. My lords, only one uh, uh, short query, or if my lords may kindly uh, uh, throw some light on the aspect that under IBC, there is a provision under Section 18. The explanation thereof says that, you know, uh, goods uh, of, I mean, contract uh, arising out of bailment and everything are excluded as far as IBC is concerned. However, if we go to the Contracts Act, Section 170 gives a Bailey a particular right, which is, which is also operative in absence of any contract to the contrary. So if uh, my lords could kindly indicate that what will be the interplay and in, in, in such a situation, whether it will be the IBC as a complete code would prevail or it will be read along with Contract Act. Thank you. See, you. If it is conflicting, then Section 18 will prevail as per section 238. If it is conflicting, please, if it is not conflicting, then also section 18 will prevail. Right, ma'am. You know, both are to be read together, section 18 will be prevailed. If something is to be excluded, is to be excluded. If it is a con conflicting with any other law, then as per section 238, section 18 will prevail. IPC will prevail over that. Please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Nirag. Uh, thank you, Your Lordship. Um, sorry, we are holding you for, for the lunch. There's a couple of more queries, Your Lordship, I'll, if I'll take your permission to put it. Yes, yes. Mr. Shomik Ghoshal, can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask the query to His Lordship? Good afternoon, my lords. It's a pleasure to have you here and being able to see you after a while is very elating for all of us. Uh, my lords, my query is very particularly relating to the uh, the doctrine of commercial wisdom, and which has been uh, laid down in uh, the judgments of the NCLAT and also affirmed by Supreme Court. Uh, I just want to know that uh, the doctrine of commercial wisdom gives a vast power to the members of the COC, and which primarily involves all the banks and the public financial institutions which have lent monies, public monies. Now, uh, oftentimes what we have realized is in very certain situations or peculiar situation, uh, the commercial wisdom that the lenders, that the financial banks are exercising may not be the best choice for the insolvency resolution process. Meaning thereby that sometimes the bankers merely have their eyes on the total asset value, and it may the they do not take into consideration the the benefit that the insolvency resolution process may inure to all other stakeholders. That that means it may be if if it's a housing society, then the home buyers, or if there are employees or laborers or various stakeholders. So in that case. Uh, I am aware that my lords have always tried to balance the equities, but whenever the matters have gone to the Supreme Court, somehow it, it, it is felt that the Supreme Court has always given more credence to this commercial wisdom aspect. So in this case, do you think that there is some lacuna in the law or do you think that the inherent powers of the adjudicating authority have to, have to be more clearly laid down in the law so that in such peculiar circumstances where this commercial wisdom the best wisdom, which does not lead to the insolvency resolution process in a better way, then, then the adjudicating authority 
can step in and balance the equities do you feel that there is a need for some search in inherent powers in the law you see i as a nclt chairperson i used to cut joke that is my habit in one way i used to say that they are harvard student i am now i have passed out of harvard so they are student and who have passed out but students finding is binding on us supreme court judgment is binding on us frankly speaking the commercial wisdom is not there if you look into the section 30 if you read with me 30 subsection 4 do not you know 30 subsection 2 first you read and if you subsection 2 if you read along with me you will understand the language section 30 subsection 2 talks of you know the re resolution professional has to examine each resolution plan and plan prepared on the basis of information memorandum number one yeah resolution professional examining is a resolution plan received by him to confirm to that resolution plan provides for insolvency resolution process cost b provides for payment of debts to the operational cater in such a manner as specified by the board in such a manner as specified by the board and shall not be less than this. Now, as specified by the board is a regulation 38. Regulation 38 within bracket one capital A. If you look into that, they say that you must, it mandates the resolution applicant to say that how much they are giving it to operational creditor how much they are giving to the financial creditor and how much they are giving to the other lenders. Other lenders, that is what. Now, these are the three things to be seen. Nothing more than that. If it complies with that, then as per subsection 3 of section 30, those plans which comply with 30 subsection 2 are to be placed before the committee of creditors. Which plan are not in accordance with 30 subsection 2? They cannot go to the committee of editors. Now, Supreme Court judgment gave highlighted to since the inventive days followed by this, that commercial wisdom what was added. Law do not talk of, it says, uh, as prescribed by the board. These are the two things. Now, commercial wisdom they highlight, according to me, there are three things, even if commercial wisdom is to be seen, according to me, first thing is the viability, second thing is the feasibility. Then the question of commercial wisdom will come. If a business is not viable, one, business is not viable, for example, 2G is not viable now. 5G is coming. This, uh, you know, the typewriter machine is not viable now. I cannot, I will not be manufacturing typewriter machine. I will be going for computer. So one is, it is not viable or it is not feasible because I am joining with a company which is part here. So not feasibility. So viability and feasibility. Third thing is the commercial wisdom. Commercial wisdom, what has been added by Honorable Supreme Court, where I said, personal view, operational creditors, they know what are the feasibility, viability, and what is to be balanced. It is the operational, the business houses, the industrialists, they understand that what will be the business at Patna, my hometown or what will be the business at Delhi or in Tamil Nadu or in Gujarat. Not the bankers. Bankers understand whether you are able to pay back the amount. Not this. So first of all, my personal opinion, it time 
will have to come either for amendment because of the committee of caters of flat buyers they don't have knowledge so supreme court will have to change that mindset that financial creditors have commercial wisdom i say no because this allot is they have no commercial wisdom they don't know anything how you miss match, match this judgment so it, this is for lawyers to argue now that how you will match this judgment will allot is they don't have commercial wisdom and they are financial creditors if they are 100% they will prevail over the operational creditors if they do not know what is the business therefore at time you know the law progress nclat gives the judgment they are after the judgment of honorable supreme court is final but there are conflicting judgment one may point out with swiss ribbons when the swiss ribbons about the operational creditor says whenever the discriminated mated and same treatment is not given to the operational creditor like the financial creditor nclat has either set aside or substituted this is the language right now same treatment what is same treatment that has not been highlighted in the subsequent judgment you know the second judgment is mainly on subsection 4 without highlighting subsection 2 of section 30 and this is because of hurried amendment made during the pendency to give a benefit to the secured creditors and without understanding that these secured <laughs> creditors can't get the benefit in the matter of i am saying this problem will be also with the nbfc this problem will be is already there with the infrastructure company therefore personal opinion a day will have to come lawyer will have to say that it requires to be looking that commercial wisdom is not the subject matter of ivc it takes of viability feasibility and other things as prescribed by the board so what board has prescribed look into that if a marking has been prescribed by the board for something mark this much for this much mark this much then it is that is to be looked into so law i think will take another 10 years two days two or three judge judgment may have to be referred to a larger bench one with regard to limitation i have got some sort of you know different opinion because a limitation which is claim is barred by limitation then he cannot file even a claim for the rp that has not yet been discussed it is to be argued young people you are there i am giving only this thought process so that you may harm fight with the court and tell the court that it requires reconsideration that there are conflicting in the one or the other the second thing is line of argument i am now telling you how a lawyer should argue now the moment a resolution plan is passed section 32 says it can be challenged on the grounds as mentioned in sub section 3 of section 61 section 61 sub section 3 does not talk of commercial wisdom that is how the supreme court easily played 61 3 do not talk of commercial wisdom therefore you don't have jurisdiction but 61 3 says if it is against the law and we have said in the sr judgment that plan of sr still that arshel and mittal is against 30 subsection 2 within bracket b because they have not given anything to operational creditors they have said nothing about operational creditors the plan should not have been gone to the committee of creditors that is the judgment you go through the nclat judgment the second thing they have not seen 
that secured creditors are getting 42,000 crore, whereas security is only 14,000 crore. So a day will have to come. This is a hurried judgment. Hurriedly, lawyers are good. Lawyers failure, I won't say courts failure. So let the lawyers pass, matter may be referred. Swiss ribbons is really excellent. You go to the other one. I have some doubt with regard to some part of the committee of creditors judgment, which is a recent one. But in any case, that is binding. Therefore, when you move before NCLT, first, first say I'm not challenging commercial wisdom. Because if you don't say, again, the NCLT judges, they will go that it is a commercial wisdom, I can't go in. You will have to point them that I am not challenging commercial wisdom. I am challenging on the ground of 6131. This law has not been followed. I am challenging on the ground of 6132. RP has not done this regularity. Tell them, show them, otherwise NCLAT judge they are thinking that now we don't have jurisdiction if a plan is approved. That misnomer is to be removed by lawyers from the mind of the present NCLAT members. And I'll be addressing, you know, I was to address them, but because of COVID, I'm not in a position to say, I'll encourage my brother judges that interfere you have the power under 61.3. First say we are not looking into commercial wisdom. Anything more? Yes, Your Lordship. The, the last two questions which we have got in the Q&A box, Mr. Tushar Mudgil wants to ask in view of section 24, subsection 4, he, and he, I'll read his question. He says, if a corporate debtor has not been, basically he wants to say, if an ex-director of a corporate debtor has not been able to attend a COC meeting and has also requested the RP to postpone the meeting, still the meeting is convened. Considering that section uh, 24, subsection 4 says that uh, the director's presence, in presence or absence shall not invalidate the proceedings of the COC, does that director have any remedy? Yes. You know, why they are asked to be present? The committee of creators, you know, the, these directors, I will say promoters, because they can point out certain things that this is the error. They can point out what are the defects. They can point out that what is the business, why it is not viable, why it is viable. If they give it in a writing that why one plan is not viable or otherwise viable or is against one or other law, the committee of creditors is bound to take into, though it is not binding, but bound to take it to a position. Those promoters can also challenge under section 61.3 and they can show that it is against the law or RP has not followed this procedure. So it is covered by 63, 61.3. So remedy is there. It is any agri person, promoter, if not there, you will be moving the application appeal. Again, he will say, I'm not challenging commercial wisdom, but this is against the law. Discrimination. Discrimination between two same set of persons, financial creditor is against the provision of law. Article 14, discrimination, you know, plan has not been given in accordance with 30 subsection 2. It is against this. Another important thing is subsection 4 of section 31. It says they must obtain approval of the commission, competition commission of India. So if in one of the judgment NCLT said that all right, it may not be mandatory before the committee of creators, but before the approval of the plan, the 
approval of the Competition Commission of India is a must. Now, if that is not taken, one can point out that it is against Section 31, Subsection 4, that the Competition Commission of India's opinion has not been taken. But while it's arguing so, they will have to show that this acquisition falls within the meaning of Section 5 of the Competition Act. They can also show that it is against one or other provision of company law. So different, you know, in IPC, you can punch competition law and comp company law together. That is the reason you have seen that even in the stage of liquidation, it was NCLT added Section 230 of the Company Act. And because of that is acquisition, so amendment was made and subsection four, competition act was also given. So all three acts are to be read together for the purpose of passing a plan. Thank you, Your Lordship. The last question of the day uh, uh, is with respect to liquidation and uh, has been raised by Mr. Hani Satpal. I'll read his question, his question Your Lordship. He says, in the judgment of your lordship in company appeal, Technology Development Board, Board versus Nikko Corporation, it was held that the liquidator of corporate debtor has the obligation to pay the gratuity. However, another bench of NCLAT in the matter of Sa Savan Godiwala states that if there is no fund created by corporate debtor, the liquidator is not allowed to arrange fund and pay. So where the obligation continues of corporate debtor, why liquidator is not allowed to arrange the gratuity and pay even if there is no fund maintained. So he wants to know your views on this. Honey Satpal is here. Uh, he was he was there. He he's there in the attending uh, he, attendees. He was the trainee. He was the law assistant in the NCLAT. You know this liquidation, the gratuity is a part which is to be. You are talking about provident fund or gratuity? No, gratuity. The question is with respect to gratuity. Gratuity, if gratuity is applicable, it is payable to the operational creditor. If it is not paid, then whoever the corporate data will come, resolution applicant, you will have to say about the dues of the operational creditor. Am I clear? Therefore, liquidator will have to pay the gratuity. Yes. Now, at the time of which time? The question is which time? Liquidation has now three times. One is 230. If 230 is gone to, so at that time it is to be settled, are you going to pay the Gratuity dues. Gratuity. If it is at the stage of the next stage, outright sell, then outright sell, then it goes along with the employee. The judgment says outright sell along with the employees. Therefore, corporate data remains and their gratuity came remains. Third stage is liquidation, actual liquidation. Second stage is OLX me beche dalo. Third stage is part by part sell. Now part by part sell, there is no provision of gratuity payment, etc. There, their payment is only two years or one year, the salary during the period of liquidation. Mark the language, not the earlier period. You know, and after giving everybody if something remains, then only they can get it. Therefore, it depends at the stage of liquidation, which stage. Therefore, two judgments are to be made or read. Because accordingly, along with the judgment of that uh, 230 and I'm forgetting the name, uh, which is of 27th of February, 2000, 
19, that judgment was delivered. So along with that, which stage? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Lordship, for uh, such an uh, amazing lecture, Your Lordship, where uh, the elegance of Your Lordship's explanation has enlightened our mind. Now I will please invite uh, Dr. Uh, Professor C.J. Ravanle, sir, to, uh, to, uh, for the concluding remarks, followed by Mr. Kumar Mihir for the vote of thanks. Sir. So indeed, uh, I would say that I believe that I was in a classroom and a teacher was teaching us how the law is to be read. And that speciality you always have carried. I keep on uh, getting this uh, impression from few of the learners whom I have taught, but now who have been practicing and they always have said this. Uh, I'm saying this with your permission, your Lordship, that uh, before your Lordship, we have less to talk, more to listen. I said that is for the right time and for the right purpose because the way you have explained those sections, my best of the learning of the today's session is that you again have taken us back to the basics of law. Because nowadays everybody I have seen, they cite different principles, but they forget the object of the law in the context of which they are citing that principle of law. So that's why people come across that they say this is applied in this case, but they forget which law was applied in that case because general principles of law and then there are specific principles of law. You also have to understand and which you were saying since the beginning that what is the object of the code? You have to understand the object of the code and then apply the principles of the law. And that's what you have been responding to several questions. Second thing which I like most about you is that you focus not just on the section, but you read the section in totality, but at the same time you point out the specific words and then you give the context and then you explain with the help of the object of the code. And if we all learn this skill from you, I think most of us will not have to draft what was said to be a brief, which has become a voluminous document in many cases nowadays because people just have to be precise and concise about what they would like to say. And the third most important thing uh, about you, sir, is that you are not just simple, you are very simple because you say things as you have read, as you have understood, as you have analyzed, as you have applied with due respect given to the other side. But yes, you make your point and you say it. And that's what we really need all the time when we argue these matters or we state things or we say things. Thank you very much for uh, being with us. This is my fourth interaction with your good self and this is my second teaching session by you uh, and I really enjoyed it and you reminded me of uh, the say of all your uh, Vandal Holmes and this is one of my favorite quote of uh, Justice Holmes. I quote, life of law has not been logic, it has been an experience, I unquote. So one cannot restrict life of law to the time or the place or to generation. Life of law always has been there. The experience will keep on changing. So the IPC, people say, the law has its life. You rightfully say, it will take 10 more years to evolve and get the experience because new contingencies will be created and the law will be applied to suit the contingency. And you rightfully said it's a resolution, which is the object of the court, not the settlement. So when it comes to resolution and settlement, you very neatly and rightly informed us about what does resolution means vis-a-vis the -vis settlement. Thank you very much, uh, your Lordship. Uh, and it was uh, indeed an opportunity for me that, you know, uh, hearing from people, but about you, but hearing from you directly is an opportunity. I could see that in your session, we received so many questions and those questions were based upon what teachings you gave to us today. So thank you very much for always being there for the young ones like us and always for the set to be the senior ones. Though you said that you have come out of the Harvard and like you said that passed out and the ones who are and that is the binding. But I must say that yes, the ones who are there 
they still take the words which were so once noted by you, stated by you, still are respected by the people. So thank you very much for the wonderful session, your Lordship. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Mr. Kumar Mihi to extend the vote of thanks, please. Thank you, Raj. I would first like to thank uh, His Lordship uh, for give, give, giving us this, uh, his consent to deliver this uh, lecture. It is indeed an honor. The session was very interesting, enlightening, and uh, extremely enjoyable. All of us who have appeared before your Lordship, in, either in NCLAT or in Supreme Court, will remember how he was there on the bench and he still hasn't changed. Uh, he's still as knowledgeable as he ever was. Uh, so it was it, indeed a great experience to listen from you, sir. I would like to thank our partners, uh, Lex, Lex Witness, uh, THS, the law firm, and Sadgamaya Group for supporting us in this endeavor. I would also like to thank my college, uh, Symbiosis Law School, and our guru and mentor, Professor Dr. C.J. Ravanle, for giving us this opportunity to uh, uh, start this endeavor and continue on this path. Uh, I would also like to thank today's moderator, Raj, for moderating the uh, session. And last but the, not the least, I would like to thank the participants of today's uh, session uh, if, uh, for giving us their support and being there in uh, during all these sessions. If you want to see today's video, uh, it's available on Symbiosis Law School's uh, YouTube channel. You can go there and have a look. I would also request you to register for tomorrow's session, uh, which is to be held at, again at 12.30 uh, tomorrow. Uh, that's it uh, for today. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Mr. Akshay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lordship. Thank you, Lordship.